I was young, milk was the indisputable food. One of the few foods you can never have too much of. Well, I drank my fair share of it. I drank tons. I drank enough for my whole family and then some. Didn't we all? Milk, milk got the kick that gives you more. Help kick. More nutrition in every pore. Help kick. I'm moving through the rhythm of a brand new day. Cause the vitamins and milk help me on my way. Kick. So get on a health kick, let it pour. America's favorite health kick. Everyone agreed that milk was good for you. I was never told to slow down, never told I was having too much. It was liquid food. It satisfied thirst and hunger at the same time. What other foods can do that? Milk made you grow tall. Milk helped your bones grow strong. But as I grew older, my mother started having second thoughts about that. Soon enough, she started telling me to stop all dairy products when I was sick with a cold or an ear infection. I thought that was the weirdest thing I had ever heard. Shouldn't I be drinking more milk when I'm sick? I have forever wanted to know the truth about milk. Some people love to love it. Some people love to hate it. Some people can't even believe we're talking about it. Surely it can't be so complicated to uncover the truth. Is it good or not? Ladies and gentlemen, in preparation for landing, please throw your bag agenda in front of you. Later articles may be placed in the overhead bins. It turns out there are a number of people out there that have something to say about milk. One of the most vocal is Robert Cohen. Back in the 90s, he wrote a book called Milk, the Deadly Poison, which caused quite a stir and got him all over the media. Money is spent by the dairy industry. If you're a doctor, you call their toll-free number, 800-Y-MILK, they'll send you $200 worth of free information. You call my toll-free number, 888-NOT-MILK, you'll get the truth. We're getting the message out as one voice to America Milk does not do the body good. Robert Cohen, you wrote a book called Milk, the Deadly Poison. How dare you? When I wrote the book, I didn't know. I didn't know how bad it really was. It's a, it's now a, I've learned. It would have been a stronger title. Milk is the most consumed product on the planet Earth. It consists of pus with hormones and glue. It's very tasty. It um, kills us before our time. And it's something we use to control the herd. Ouch, that sounds a little rash and dramatic. Nonetheless, my conversation with Robert is long and informative. Um, 177 million cases of foodborne illness every year, according to our Centers of Disease Control. And 40% of the average diet, 666 pounds, is milk and dairy. That's what does it. What, so what are you drinking here? What's this milk that you're drinking? Uh, this milk is a special kind of milk called soy milk. It comes from a bean. It's a soy chai, which means that it's made with the spices of cardamom, ginger, cinnamon, clove, a little bit of pepper, so and it's okay. a wonderful drink. Yeah, it's great. Isn't it okay? You're drinking it. It's not bad. It's not bad, actually. You want to go get a glass of milk for yourself? Mm. I just made. You I'm just made? Would you be okay with that? I would be fine with it as long as you feel like drinking the pus and the hormones and the glue. But it's not all bad news, okay? You what's will be the, getting. What's the good news? You'll be getting lots of estrogen. You'll and, be getting lots of progesterone. And do I need those things? Um, only if you want them. Really? Yeah, they they will work. Well, I'm, I just may. I, I mean, I haven't had a glass of milk in a while. I think it might be, uh, you know, it might be fun. If you think you can tolerate the milk in my comments, go for it. Aren't you being just a little too over dramatic about this? Is it that bad? Seriously? It's worse. There we go. Okay. I'll be right back. <laughs> to his glass of milk, to his learning experience. Seriously, Robert's opinion just feels blown out of proportion. We've been drinking milk forever. We can't all be wrong. Do you guys drink milk? Yes. Of course, yes. <laughs> Lots of milk? Yes. yes. Every Lots. morning. 
love milk. Everybody should drink milk. Yes. Ab absolutely. At our age, the calcium. I love milk. Yeah. I drink milk. Yes. I hate milk. <laughs> this morning I had this large cold glass of milk. No, I don't drink milk because I don't like the taste. I drink a lot of milk, actually, like a, like a, a lot, a lot of milk. When I drink milk, I have stomach ache. From a cow? <laughs> I have every day on cereal for breakfast. I've been drinking milk all my life. No. I sometimes have a glass with a cookie. We call them biscuits, but I'd have a biscuit and a glass of milk. I mean, like, who doesn't like milk with cookies? Like, it's so good. Or who doesn't like ice cream that's made out of milk? <laughs> It's always cold, it's always in my fridge, and it's always available. Oh, there's a lot of people who are saying that milk is not good for you. Have you ever heard that? Um, nope. Never? No. Nope. Did you ever hear that milk may not be good for you? Um, well, my friend's vegan, and she tells me that all the time, but... Oh, if you want someone to whine about something, you'll find somebody to whine about something, and you'll find a study with screwed stats that'll also whine about something, so I'm sure there are lots. What else are you going to drink if you're not drinking milk? I don't know. I never heard about all that. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's not get overzealous. And so you've never heard that it might not be good? No, never. Where's this from? A lot of books have been written on it now. Really? Yeah. No, never heard that at all. I'm going to have to look into that. Well, that's what I intend to do as well, as I continue to search for other people with educated opinions on milk. Yes. <laughs> but you don't want me to give you one word answer, I'm sure. Um, yes, dairy products um, are, are good for your health. And, and some of it is, is, you know, the things that your mother told you. Uh, in fact, uh, if you make the list of all of the essential uh, mineral nutrients, they're all in milk. And certainly uh, milk is perhaps the best source of calcium. Dairy products or milk and alternatives uh, are good for us because our body needs calcium. We need a certain amount of calcium every day in order to either help our bones grow if we're young or to help maintain our bone density. It is really difficult to get enough calcium if we don't include milk in our diet. Yes, broccoli contains some calcium, bok choy as well, almonds as well. However, the bioavailability of calcium in plant products versus milk and alternatives varies. We only absorb maybe 10% of the calcium from broccoli because it is less bioavailable. The calcium is less available in certain plant products than it is in milk and alternatives. The calcium in milk is released more slowly during the digestive process, so it has a better chance um, to, uh, to be absorbed. Now this makes sense to me. It's in line with what I've always felt. Milk is good and it inspires me to get closer to the source, which lands me in America's Dairyland. I have a firm belief in the goodness of the nutrition that dairy products can bring to the, uh, literally to the table, as an essential part of daily nutrition. Pete Harden is a senior editor and publisher for the monthly paper, The Milkweed, which analyzes the economics, the marketing, and the political climate of the U.S. and global dairy industries. The milkweed is regarded, for better or worse, as the cutting edge of analysis as to what's going on in the dairy industry. Uh, we do no news releases. It's all original reporting and a lot of investigative reporting. People who are familiar with it either like it or hate it. Oh, I drink milk every day with a main meal. Every day. That's, that's a, part of, a key part of the main meal. In my opinion, milk and, and the array of dairy products available are fundamental nutrition. Cow's milk contains a complete protein readily available to most human beings. Milk to me, when I was growing up, was on the table at every meal. Uh, milk in our little corner of New Jersey was the, almost the only economic show in town. There were 4,000 dairy farms in my county when I was a kid.
Since time began, milk has been one of the most nutritious of all foods. Composed of proteins, butter fat, carbohydrates, calcium, and a complete assortment of all the vitamins required by man. Truly a wonderful gift from nature. But only during recent years has milk been brought up to its present high standards of purity and goodness. Remember the milking conditions of yesteryear? Compare them with the improved and vastly more sanitary operations of today. Today in Wisconsin, dairy is big business. And dairy farms can get quite large. The largest family-owned dairy is owned by John Pagel. My dad came back from the service after World War II in 1946 bought an 80-acre farm and they started milking eight cows. And we currently have uh, just shy of 8,000 acres and we're milking 7,000 cows in two different locations. We produce about 10 million gallons of milk per month. Milk has always been nature's best food. There's proof for bone density and structure for children, uh, twice as many bone fractures on kids that did not drink milk as kids that do. It's, it's important that everybody has some type of dairy product in their, in their diet. I drink milk every day, three glasses plus. In Wisconsin, the dairy industry, the dairy heritage has been so strong it's the number one industry in the state of Wisconsin. And if we're gonna to continue to modernize and consolidate, we need to educate the people that consolidation is a good thing, not a bad thing. And if we can get local support that are not people from the industry, it's better for everybody. Wisconsin, of course, has smaller farms as well. Those were run by people who like to think they have relationships with their cows. I mean, people love pets, and I like to think that we have a hundred and some pets because we try to give them a good life, and I think that they understand that maybe. I don't know. Milk is complete nutrition. It's all you need, so Jim told me when I came here. <laughs> Well, Jim may have been wrong about that. <laughs> I, I, I think you need more than just milk, but I was a dairy farmer, like I said. Um, milk is the best way to convert inedible plants to quality human protein. Even people that, you know, really like family farms and bioorganic food don't know exactly what a farm is like. You know, they don't know that cows manure every day and manure is messy and, and that sort of thing. And I think everybody should know where their food comes from. When you buy a carton of milk, there's generally a picture of a cow and the grass and a red barn in the background. Well, that's not the way most milk is produced, but that's the way it's sold as being produced. So, you know, production practice is really the big difference, I think, in, in what the farmers are doing, how they're raising their animals, how they're caring for the land. In Canada as well, we find farmers just as committed to producing quality milk. Well, our farm is a, is a family farm. It's uh, run by myself and my parents, maybe someday one of my children, but uh, I wouldn't consider it a factory farm per se. Uh, all our animals are you know, purebred registered animals that have names. Uh, we don't uh, refer to them by number. I do drink uh, the, the milk from the farm and uh, the first response anyone gives for why you should drink milk is calcium, but uh, I'd like to think that you know, milk and milk protein and cheese are, are both nutritious and delicious, so uh, I may be biased a little bit being a, a dairy producer myself, but uh, I like knowing where the milk that goes in my fridge comes from. I like, uh, you know, the, the thought that I provide food for thousands of people.
thousand miles away, on the other side of the spectrum, we find Neil Barnard. Now is the time to get on the track to a slimmer body, a healthier body. A physician and clinical researcher with the George Washington School of Medicine in Washington, D.C. Milk is the perfect food if you happen to be a little baby calf. And other than that, it's really quite unnecessary. Published in many leading scientific journals and is also the president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, which conducts research on preventive medicine, more particularly, good nutrition. There is some nutrition in milk. There's calcium in milk, for example. The problem is that everything that goes along with it is something that you can get in a much healthier form somewhere else. My research team used a low-fat vegan diet for people with diabetes, and what we found is it's terrific. The medical establishment's view on milk really is changing. Up until fairly recently, people would say it's the perfect food. It's got calcium, it has protein, it has fats, and, and so forth. But starting a couple of decades ago, people started to become concerned. Number one, uh, the milk sugar causes digestive problems. But it was much more than that. The milk fat turns out to be a kind of fat that may raise cholesterol and may cause other kinds of problems. Uh, there's even been some new research showing links with prostate cancer. So the view on, on milk really has changed from very positive to now one of, of real caution. Your best food investment that means health and strength. Milk, all fresh, all pure, all energizing, and all good. Triple goodness, thanks to modern dairies and old bosses. Historically, people have hoped that milk would prevent osteoporosis. After all, it has calcium in it. But when you do the studies and you actually look over the years, people who drink the most milk have either no protection at all from fractures, or they may even have more fractures than other people. The reason seems to be that that little bit of calcium is not enough to make a difference. And the protein that's in milk, some of the other factors like sodium in milk, may actually be harmful. Best case scenario, milk is not helping against osteoporosis. Some evidence suggests it might even be harmful. You know, many people will say, well, let's make milk healthier. Let's take all that fat out and have non-fat milk. And you know what? That's a good move. And you can make it healthier still by taking out those proteins that tend to trigger allergies, migraines for some people. And then you could take the hormones out, remove all of that, and pretty soon you know what you're going to be left with? A glass of water. And maybe that's what we really should be drinking. As it turns out, Dr. Barnard is not the only researcher to raise concerns about the effects of milk on our health. I came from a dairy farm, milk of cows. So I thought cow's milk is the best thing going. I thought the good old American diet, high in fat, high in protein, and so forth, with a lot of meat. I always thought that was the best there is. So my research in the early days was kind of focused on that. In fact, my doctor dissertation was focused on the question of how do we produce animal protein more effectively? Dr. Campbell has been at the forefront of nutrition research for the last 40 years. He is the Jacob Gould Sherman Professor Emeritus of Nutritional Biochemistry at Cornell University and has also taught at Oxford in England. He wrote a controversial book called The China Study, which tells the story of his research project on nutrition that took over 20 years of his life. The study has been touted as the most comprehensive study of health and nutrition ever conducted. We focused on this question, does protein really increase liver cancer? Incidentally, liver cancer in animals is a good model to study cancer in general. We can learn a lot of things that way. So we wanted to know, is it really true? Because that, that was really odd. So we did lots of research for the next 27 years on that project alone and published at least 50 papers in professional journals. We got it peer reviewed many, many times over. What we found was that we could turn on cancer growth by giving more protein and turn it off by taking, you know, decreasing the protein. Increasing the protein turned it on, decreasing it turned it off. Then we did lots of studies, biochemical studies, clinical studies, and things like that, and these animals understand, you know, how does this work? 
And we found every time we look for an explanatory mechanism, which enzyme, which hormone, which this, which that, every time we look for an explanatory mechanism, we found one. What turned out to be a really important observation because that tends to upset the apple cart for what Western medicine is all about. You know, there's something else going on here. So the effects were with the protein was dramatic and the protein that we tested that was doing this was casein. Casein is the main protein of cow's milk. I am come from the dairy farm. Early part of my career I'm saying, hey, we got to have more animal protein. And here are one of the most important proteins of all in the minds of most people, cow's milk protein, was turning on cancer. I said, whoa, this is, this is a bit much. But we studied it so thoroughly in so many ways, got it published and so forth, I had colleagues review it and, and all of that. And I, I mean, I, I dare anyone to try it. It works. It's really dramatic. And the protein level that required to turn on cancer is the protein that's fed in excess to the amount we need. Protein is an important nutrient. We need protein, absolutely we need protein. But we only need so much. Most of us consume in excess of that. So it's the amount in excess that turns on cancer. Robert, you, you, you tell me not to drink this milk. I'm so tempted, but when I look into this milk, I see good, clean, wholesome, liquid, perfect food. What do you see? Let me look. Let me look and see what you're looking at there. No, I don't see the same thing. The key to disease is animal protein. 25 years ago, the average North American ate 10 pounds of cheese per year. Today, it's 34 pounds. It takes 10 pounds of milk to make a pound of cheese. Is it all in the milk, really? I mean, it it's all in the milk. Even though we have more studies than ever showing that milk and dairy products can be linked to certain disease conditions, the, the market is going in exactly the opposite direction. People are consuming more cheese, for example, than ever before. Yogurt is arriving and people are thinking this must be healthy, but it really isn't. Um, and I just looked at the figures. About a century ago, the average North American consumed less than four pounds of cheese per year. Today, we're over about 33 pounds. I'm talking about one person in the course of a year. And that's pizza, the cheese that's on burgers and so forth, and fattens us up and it makes us unhealthy. So if milk is really that bad, why in the world is it still included in our food guides? We have a food guide in order to place food in categories according to the nutrient that is the most present in these foods. A lot of people think that the food guide is controversial because the grain people gave them money, that the dairy farmers gave them money to put these foods on the food guide. Are we paid to, to say a certain thing? Absolutely not. When USDA changed what their recommendations are for the food service, especially in the school systems and the meals that, that we uh, feed our children with, they increase the amount of dairy products inside of the meals recommended for our, for our kids in our schools. So that tells you that somebody is starting to understand how the importance of dairy in a diet. Milk fat is probably the area that gets the, the worst image publicly. Um, however, there's some good news stories emerging there as well. If you're going to eat fat, there's lots to commend milk fat. Um, yes, there's high levels of saturated fats, but it also has, um, among those saturated fats, uh, a large proportion of those are medium chain fatty acids. Perhaps one of the best known examples is conjugated linoleic acid. Um, and you can buy CLA, conjugated linoleic acid, you can buy CLA tablets. CLAs have been shown in the past 25 years or so in great part through research at the University of Wisconsin to be among the greatest cancer-fighting substances in the diet. What's good for me may not be good for you, or at least it may not have the same effect in, in your nutritional uh, profile um, as it has in, in mine. Um, so for example, uh, if you take something again from milk, 
um, uh, different people metabolize cholesterol differently. So I may be able to consume large quantities of uh, cholesterol and it doesn't affect me very much. In fact, that seems to be the case because I eat a lot of cheese <laughs> and my cholesterol levels are okay. That one's amazing. Nutrition is always changing. Nutrition is an evolving science. And we do sometimes, very often, find new evidence that may make us reverse a recommendation that we've had in the past. And that's normal. And I think that's why there's so much room for conspiracy theories and so much room for myths is because we seem sometimes to flip-flop between our recommendations when in fact we're trying to go with the scientific research, which is always changing. When we look at the food guidance diagrams that have evolved over the decades, um, milk has had sort of a special place, including its own food group. And there's really no reason for that. And, and when you ask people why that is, they'll say, well, it has calcium, and so people should consume it for calcium. But the fact is there are plenty of other calcium-containing foods, and I, frankly, I think we should have kicked out the milk group a long time ago. When I testified, I was one of 27 Americans to testify before the Food Pyramid Committee, and Dr. Eileen Kennedy, who is an undersecretary of USDA, instructed the 27 of us to let USDA know who we were, the name of our organization, and who finances us. So my turn came and I said, Dr. Kennedy, my name is Robert Cohen. I'm with the Dairy Education Board. We have a shoestring budget. I pay for my own shoe shoestrings. But then I pointed to her in front of TV cameras and I said, the American people want to know who finances you. And I heard gasps in the audience. Ooh, what is he saying? because I've researched you. You're on the board of directors of the Dan and Yogurt Research Foundation. And I went down the line, Dr. Garza on that committee, gets $500,000 a year from the United States Department of Agriculture to promote milk at Cornell University's agricultural research program. And up and down the line, Shirley Watkins, name after name at USDA, worked for the dairy industry. So it, it, it came as a shock when I researched and found out these dirty little secrets but it's all about cash flow. It's money, money. It's all about money. The, the, the fundamental, you know, beyond any of the new discussions of nutrition, dairy generates tremendous cash flow on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis. So money blurs the truth. It wouldn't be the first time I hear that, but it certainly feels like there is quite a world behind those milk mustaches. industry that has yet to accept my invitation to talk or answer my questions. We've got uh, two lobbyists, two attorneys, and a board of directors that represents about 900 dairy producers and companies that support the dairy industry. Their mission is to have a seat at the table when it comes to regulatory issues and then also to work with uh, politicians and try to get the right people elected that understand the importance of the dairy industry in Wisconsin. I found Richard Nixon in the White House, our great president, who said the most famous quotation out of the White House in his administration, I am not a crook. Was he a crook? I ask people, was he a crook? Because I filed a Freedom of Information Act request for March 23rd, 1971, when he's visited by three members of the dairy industry holding each a duffel bag filled with a million cash. He got three million cash on that day. The next day, at a session of his cabinet, he arbitrarily raised the price of milk. It wasn't even an issue, 17 cents per 100 pounds, which turned out to be a $300 million price increase. One week earlier, the Secretary of Agriculture, Clifford Hardin, said there'd be no increase in the price of milk that year because of the enormous surplus. So Nixon took a $3 million bribe to give the dairy industry a $300 million cash increase. President after president has done the same thing. So another industry tinted with corruption. It isn't the first time I hear that either. But that doesn't mean the milk itself is bad. But the disagreement and controversy continue. I think we could trace back some of the controversy in dairy to the late 80s when Monsanto Corporation 
was developing their synthetic cow growth hormone, which uh, a, bi a biotech hormone, which if injected into some cows would uh, create 10 or 15 pounds of more milk per day, so Monsanto claimed. In 1990, during the approval process for the genetically engineered bovine growth hormone, known as RBGH, or RBST, recombinant bovine somatotropin, I learned that Monsanto's laboratory animals, everyone got cancer from the study. The study was done in France for Searle Pharmaceuticals for Monsanto. It was a very famous 90-day study that I learned was a 180-day study. They call the second 90 days the reverse phase of the study. And during that phase, every animal got cancer. The RBGH was approved at about the time we were starting to question you know, the whole industrial chemical farm system. So all you wanted to do is to get that cow to give more milk to make more profit, basically for the people that were producing the growth hormone, not the farmers. Um, so no, we, in fact, maybe that was one of the things that really galvanized us to continue into organic and to become really, I guess what a lot of people would say, activists on a lot of, of farm and social issues. The recombinant bovine growth hormone controversy was the origination and then development of the organic dairy sector. Producers and consumers started voting with their pocketbook. Consumers are willing to pay a premium for what they perceive to be a more natural product. Well, the U.S. is allowed to give growth hormones to their cows in order to produce more milk. In Canada, it is banned. We are not allowed to buy and use growth hormones on our cows. There's something in cow's milk called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor. In test tube studies, it causes cancer cells to grow. Nobody wants to be drinking that. And they discovered that when you inject growth hormone into cows, it increases that IGF-1 in the milk. So organic farmers said, well, we won't use growth hormone. We won't use this at all. And that's a good move, except then it has turned out that what causes the IGF-1 in the human body is just drinking the milk. It's the protein and the sugars in the milk causing the IGF-1 to develop within your own body. And that's true if it's organic or not. But why does it have to be so complicated? It's all about IGF-1 and RGBH and all hormone this and hormone that. It's good stuff that we've been drinking for thousands of years. Why can't it just be good? Well, what's the problem? Are you not sort of like conjuring all this up? Are you making it up? Are you just trying to be dramatic? It's, it's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling how complex and controversial milk is. And I, I wish you luck putting it all together. excellent source of calcium. Everything's wrong. Milk does the body good. It looks disgusting to me. Migraines, arthritis. Scientific studies have not proven in the long run. I don't like people lying. I will tread carefully on this one. I'm particularly concerned about children. Milk is complete nutrition. Nutritious and delicious. Two glasses, three glasses a day. Milk fat. Saturated fat. The wrong kind of fat. Protein, fat, calcium. It's conjugated linoleic acid. It's a better quality product, just drinking the milk, because I like the taste. The phrase cash cow comes to mind. Financial incentives. Market share. 300 million cash increase. We were tired of chemicals. And progesterone and prolactin and melatonin. Too much protein. Recombinant bovine growth hormone. Cholesterol. Prostate cancer. Significant anti-carcinogenic properties. Gastrointestinal peptides, hypothalamic hormones. Milk needs to be served at the correct temperature, nice and cold, fresh and cold. We don't drink pig milk. We don't drink dog milk. Kids are more obese today than they've ever been before. I eat a lot of cheese. It's a good old American diet. We don't drink elephant milk. I find it personally offensive. Nutrition is always changing. Somehow we delight in the thought of drinking this big 2,000 pound beast that has feces on its underside. That's the milk we enjoy and we think it's wholesome. And it's not. Milk, is, uh, as far as a food is concerned, it may be our biggest problem we have to face in the future. Have you ever taken a milk 
bath. <laughs> uh, not on purpose. <laughs> Would you want to try, maybe? I'll, I'll try anything once. <laughs> no, no. Um, have you ever thought of taking a milk bath? Um... No, but I would necessarily be against it. Um, I heard that the properties for skin, especially uh, if it's curdled milk, I heard that Cleopatra at one point uh, was was said to uh, bathe herself in goat's milk. It's fucking cold. No. <laughs> Why not? Because I'm disgusted. I'd rather uh, go into the Hudson River in New York City and have a feces bath. Oh, this is hilarious. To do what exactly? To stew in the very enigma that plagues my thoughts. Okay, well, I will never again question your dedication to the other. <laughs> never been tempted. <laughs> and we're out. How we consume it, how we prepare it, and how our bodies react seems to be infinitely complicated. Elucidating what I thought was just a simple yes or no question is more complex than I ever imagined. I'm left with a bunch of disagreeing people and no real answers. And yet, I find another perspective to consider in the story of Michael Schmidt. Milk is crystallized love, when you really think about it. Milk is the first thing a baby gets from the mother when the mother and baby separated. The only thing what connects them is actually the milk. So when you think about it, that that the sacrifice a cow is giving by providing this milk as nourishment for others, I, I, find, it, I find it very fascinating to look, at, to look at that from that point of view. In order to know what bread is, you need to be hungry. In order to know what water is, you need to be thirsty. In order to know what milk is, you need to love it. And so I would say milk is a physical manifestation of love. And when you cherish it in that way, and when you look at that in that way, then milk becomes a completely different substance than the commodity on our corporate farms. Michael Schmidt is considered a fringe dairy farmer. He is a producer and staunch advocate of raw milk. I even don't know if I would drink milk if I wouldn't have my own milk or if I wouldn't have access to raw milk. I probably just would say, well, you, you know what, forget it. I don't, I, I, I don't want to drink it. It didn't occur to me until I actually arrived in Canada that, that milk itself can be portrayed as a dangerous product. And that is where I think I became very passionate and said, no, that's impossible. That's impossible when you look at when you look at uh, you know how France and Switzerland and Austria and Germany what what colorful variety of products they make out of raw milk and here it is it seems to be a white poison so it, it didn't make sense I think we have lost the the concept of the art of farming Food became a commodity and food was not anymore a cultural expression of society. And therefore, we have no understanding that a living food is the most important thing for a living body.
And if you eat a, a, a dead food, that has its effect on your body in the same way. Michael Schmidt is not the only raw milk advocate. Raw milk seems to be a growing trend. There is an increasing number of people in the U.S. considering it as a viable option. Conventional milk is produced, um, the animals are kept largely in confinement, eating a mostly grain-based diet, which causes all kinds of health problems in the animals, and produces a milk which is not at all like the milk that comes from a grass-fed animal. That milk is then put through literally miles of pipes and tubing in a milk plant, it comes out the other end as the products that you see in the supermarket, completely devoid of life, enzymes. Ron Schmidt is the author of The Untold Story of Milk, which depicts the history, the politics, and the science of what he considers nature's perfect food. Raw milk, on the other hand, from, particularly from an animal that's out eating pasture, is a, is a rich, vibrant, en enzyme-rich, life-supporting food. Raw milk has a sweetness and a freshness and a vibrance to its taste that might take some getting used to, but if you give it a chance and get used to it, it's like the difference between eating cardboard and, and eating a, a, a good steak. Cook the way you like it. Raw milk saved the colonies. They were floundering in the 1600s, in the early years of the establishment of the colonies on the East Coast, until literally a couple of boatloads of cows arrived. And the, the cow was absolutely essential in the um, uh, settlement and development of early America. Raw milk was a, an essential part of a natural foods diet that would reverse the course of disease. And doctors knew that at the turn of the 20th century, around 1900. And there were hospitals in, in Europe where they specifically had therapies based on raw milk. Uh, along with that, there were proponents of pasteurization who said, no, let's just pasteurize all milk, not worry about how it's produced, and just pasteurize it and it'll be safe that way. Why are we fooling around with our food when we actually can have it right off our cow in the way how it's supposed to be? So the notion that, that all pasteurized milk is safe and all raw milk is dangerous is purely a political notion. Politically, sorry to say, food is a weapon. Food is a weapon. And when you have food in, in the hands of a few corporations, you control people. So, and that is where we get into the, you know, the big political picture here. Do not underestimate the power and the danger we are in because of the concentration of foods, uh, of the food production uh, into the hands of a few big corporations. Not only is the truth about milk more complex and elusive than I thought, it's politically and legally complicated too. Sticky, messy, and sometimes sour. My son had watched already in the morning that there was a police car and a truck sitting, you know, very close to our entrance at the farm and said, well, it looks kind of strange. Conducting an investigation into the illegal sale of uh, milk and milk products, okay. which are unpasteurized, okay. coming from this location. We have a warrant to search your residence here. Entire farm flooded with, with armed officers. They were securing buildings. They were running to doors. They took basically the farm apart. They took equipment out, took computers away. And it was pure harassment. It was pure scare tactic to get us out of that, you know, track to legalize raw milk. So it was it it was a real attack on a small farm. After 10 years of legal wrangling, Michael Schmidt gets his court verdict in January 2010. It's, uh, I didn't expect such a clear verdict. It's, uh, what's it called? Not guilty on all charges. But the debate continues and the battle is not over. The government filed an appeal in 2011, pushing Schmidt to go on a widely publicized hunger strike, asking for open dialogue. It has to be a human right that we have the right to choose our food. And that is worthwhile fighting for. I mean, I don't want to say it, but it's almost worth dying for. 
After 40 days, Ontario's Premier gives Schmidt a chance to make his case to caucus. With the appeal date expected in mid-2012, Michael Schmidt continues to produce and distribute raw milk. His future, however, remains unsure. Raw milk is a way for you to be strong and healthy. It is freedom from disease. It is freedom from political oppression. It is freedom for the human spirit. It is freedom to live the way human beings have historically lived, not the way they live today under the yoke of corporate power. Raw milk, yes or no? That's a huge political issue. I would estimate in the U.S. that behind uh, use of marijuana and income tax evasion, raw milk is probably the third highest form of civil disobedience in this country. Uh, in the past week, there's a, a AP Associated Press article estimating that some nine million Americans at least semi-regularly consume raw milk. So raw milk. Could it be the way back to the simple goodness of milk? Could it settle the current tug of war over its merits? If raw milk sales were legal in Wisconsin, we'd consider doing it. On my cereal, I use raw milk. If I'm making chocolate milk, I'll use raw milk. You know, pasteurization doesn't only remove the bad bacteria. So our, my personal preference is to drink milk right out of the bulk tank. I've been drinking raw milk ever for 32 years. Um, it's never made me ill. We, we live in a society where everybody is afraid of something and uh, we think it has to be manipulated to make it safe. And uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not of that way of thinking. Um, As a society today, we've become a bit germophobic and, and our, our goal is to kill 99.9% .9 of all bacteria. And I don't think that's necessarily the approach that we want to take. Good bacteria can be found in raw milk, I agree with, and I think that that's, that's, that's been proven. The way that milk is produced right now for mass production is not suitable for raw milk production. If you were to all of a sudden snap your fingers and reinvent the dairy industry, so that raw milk was a safe alternative, sure, I would definitely think that there would be benefits to drinking raw milk. But yet again, there's no consensus here either. I hear this argument all the time, you know, my grandmother and her grandmother before her, and we've had six generations and we've always drank the raw milk from our cows and nobody ever got sick. Um, that may be true, but you probably don't know how many people actually got sick from consuming that. All those flus you had were probably uh, from consuming pathogenic bacteria in your farm products. All milk should be pasteurized. It's for the safety of your own family. It's for the safety of the consumers. What I'm concerned about, I know people say it should be uh, personal choice. When I grew up on the farm, my parents had a pasteurizer in the kitchen sink and we pasteurized our milk. I did not grow up on uh, milk that was not pasteurized. And I'm concerned for people that do drink raw milk, that if they get sick, all dairy products or all milk will be looked at as a dangerous item. Some people advocate raw milk. And frankly, I think you have to live in a country that has really good health insurance in order for you to want to do that. Um, it's a product that comes out with traces of bacteria in it, some of which can be deadly. And the idea of consuming that, I think, is something no one should contemplate. It's dangerous. It's really dangerous because, you know, one of the reasons it got pasteurized is because of the organisms that it can carry and can cause problems. Anytime you, 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 you take something that's not pasteurized or something that's raw, there are risks of, of, getting, of getting sick from various bacteria. Some people may read more into the health benefits of raw milk and some people may think it's terrible. I, uh, I've been to university for long enough that I, I can find uh, a scientist that can statistically prove both sides. So, I guess it personally bothers me, and we've talked about this before, that for someone to say that what you're selling is unsafe and the only way to make it safe, safe is if we pasteurize it. We, you know, I, if, if we aren't producing a safe product as it comes out of the cow, why would we want to sell it? I mean, that's just, would be just wrong. 
in 95% of our, the cases of our, of our cow share members, the milk made them healthier. For God's sakes, people can buy cigarettes and guns and cars and we know that they're dangerous. If the government infringes on the right that people actually can feel better with this food, then it becomes a severe constitutional question. I think people should have the choice, but the main thing is they need to know where it comes from. They need to have confidence in the farm. And that's not, or shouldn't be just for raw milk. It should be for anything you eat. I, I'm, I'm not scientifically capable of saying that raw milk is gonna, gonna save the universe and, and, and is, is the perfect health food. But I think the raw milk advocates have put a lot of science a lot of research, a lot of personal experiences into what they're pushing, and they are bucking up against a federal agency which is nothing but a shill for the major corporate interests in food in this country. There's very little, if any, evidence that says there is um, anything more healthy about raw than about pasteurized. On the other hand, what we can say with absolute scientific certainty is that the risk associated with raw milk is massively higher than the risk associated with pasteurized milk. And at some point you have to say, wait a minute, this is a cow and the milk was produced for the cow's baby to help that baby grow very rapidly and after the age of weaning even the calf doesn't consume milk anymore. So this product in humans is linked to just as many health problems as the commercial milk is linked to. Come on. Our society was built, this country was built on the nourishment of milk. If milk was the last food left on earth, um, I would probably be one of the first to go because I wouldn't be eating it. And I can't imagine a world because the cow wouldn't survive if all that was left was milk. Because cows don't drink it. How do they get the calcium if they don't drink milk? Boy, it just beats me. They eat grass, they eat green things, and, and that's what I would do. If someone would rather eat tofu and nuts, uh, you can have my share. <laughs> Why do you think milk is so controversial? Because it's a food. Because <laughs> it's a food. Everything is controversial in the food world. Food is a very passionate issue. In many of these controversies, the truth is always somewhere in the middle. If someone gives you a straight-up answer, they're probably not considering all angles. All milk should be pasteurized. With absolute scientific certainty. Traces of bacteria in it, some of which can be deadly. Why are we fooling around with our food? Good bacteria can be found in raw milk. It's dangerous. It's purely a political notion. Worth dying for. We were talking about food safety. Heart disease and the asthma and the diabetes. That body of research is overwhelming. Let's not get overzealous. Well, the information on milk over the years has been a serious distortion of the facts. Milk has always been nature's best food. Yes. No. Yes. No. Uh, no. Yes. No. Homogenization. Pasteurization. Raw milk. Rich in enzymes. Quality. Safety. It's seriously questioned. It's, it's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling how complex and controversial milk is. Don't we humans just love to bicker? The less we understand, the more we argue, and the more polarized we become. We rush to side with assumption, speculation, hypothesis, and especially the so-called scientifically proven. After two years of inquiry, I'm still left with a group of experts that disagree, and the same question that leads to many conflicting answers. What I do know is that there is a reason milk has coursed through the veins of our society for thousands of years. Milk is precious. But could it be that we've abused it? The story of milk is complicated and personal to many people, especially when it is so deeply tied to the very first emotion we were so willing to feel when our mothers first held us. 
It's always healthy to welcome discussion, and it's healthy to strive for the right to make an educated choice. But for this, we need the education and the chance to choose. My mother raised doubts about drinking milk when I was young, only because she wanted me to be healthy. She did the best she could with the information she had, and I couldn't be more lucky. And it is now my turn to raise my own child. I will share the information with my daughter just like my mother did with me, and encourage her to be brave enough to continue seeking the truth as it evolves, and make her own educated choices. You're laughing now, but tomorrow yeah. you're going to feel it. It tastes good, right? Fantastic. It tastes good. You even got a little milk mustache there. Okay. Makes you look beautiful. <laughs>